Hello. Welcome to the third episode of the interview series for my blog, The Cello Book. My name is Byung-Yin Yu, and today I'm joined with a fantastic guest. He's the principal cellist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and as a published author. Thank you so much for joining me, Blaze. Thank you, byung -Yu. Pleasure to be here. So to begin, I want to first ask you about what sort of, when did you first take up the cello and when did you decide to sort of make it the instrument that you'd carry on for the rest of your life? Uh, well, you know, it's, it, it's really because of my brother. So my, my older brother, who's six years older than me, is also a cellist. And so he plays right now with Ensemble Attaque Contemporain in Paris, which is this new, new music ensemble founded by Pierre Boulez. And so I always heard him play cello at home. And so like, you know, any smaller brother, I wanted to do just like him. And he sounded good. So I figured out it would be easy, you know. Um, so that's really why I picked it up. Uh, I started when I was eight, so pretty normal age compared to what people do these days. Um, and I, I always say, like, I always knew I was going to be a cellist. It just took different stages to understand what it would take to actually be a professional cellist, you know. Um, and so, but I always thought I would be a cellist. I never really thought about anything else. So you're obviously an incredible orchestra cellist because, well, you're the principal cellist of the BSO. But I was wondering if, like, when did you first draw the distinction that you wanted to be specifically an orchestral cellist compared to, like, a soloist, perhaps? Um, I'm not sure if I drew it that sharply, you know, for a while. I think for a while I was, I was, I was just, you know, like most people, I mean, I figured, you know, you're in school, you're trying to get better, just be a good cellist, period, a good musician, period. And, and so, you know, I, I think I, I mean, I, I guess when I was in my early 20s, I was starting to figure out that I actually don't really like the, the lifestyle of a solo cellist. Mm. Uh, the idea of traveling all over the place, being in hotels alone, and, you know, that didn't really attract me. Like, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a homebody. I like to be home with my cat and then and see my friends and all that. So that I figured I figured that out. And uh, and plus maybe I didn't. You know, it's very competitive to get in that field too. So, um, but then I always liked orchestra. You know, I did a lot of youth orchestras when I was younger. Uh, I did the French youth orchestras and I did the European youth orchestra. Uh, I did one tour with the Gustav Mahler youth orchestra also. So I really like that. I really like the sense of community. I really like playing in the nice halls. Um, I do like touring with a group. I think that's a different experience than touring alone. Um, I love the repertoire. You know, the, the repertoire is so vast. I feel like, you know, there's no doubt for me, for example, like Strauss or Mahler or composers that I understand so much better now after 15 years in the BSO than I did when I started, you know. Mm. Uh, and in a way, sometimes now I think like, how could someone play, you know, the Strauss cello sonata if they haven't played, you know, the Strauss orchestral pieces because you you learn so much from that. Um, so yeah, getting into orchestra, I mean, I, I think it sort of made sense. I think it's like more in hindsight. Once it happened, you're like, well, it may it make sense because I did this before and all that. But when when I when I took my first BS audition, it was just really more random. I was literally being living across the street, you know, from the the stage door. Mm. And and frankly, if there had been an audition for, like, say, the Chicago Symphony or New York Phil, or I'm not even sure I would have traveled for that. I literally took it because it was across the street. Um, so that's how it happened, and and you know, and then I I, I stayed. But I, that's really my advice whenever people ask me, like, oh, how do you become an orchestra cellist? I'm like, for now, just try to be the best you can be, you know, and later you'll you'll see how you win your job. You know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring up the sort of like the vastness and repertoire for obviously like symphony orchestra compared to like solo cello because um like the repertoire for um the cello is very sadly limited in terms of like concertos and such but yeah um to sort of change topic i want to talk to you about arrangement because to be frank with you before i knew you were the principal cellist of the boston symphony orchestra um i first heard your name when i was just browsing through youtube and like seeing all these like incredible arrangements for like cello ensembles and and for from like Piazzolo and Mozart and I'll, I'll always see like arranged by Desjardin and I'd be like who who is this man and then I sort of came across you um and I was sort of curious about like when did you be begin with um creating these arrangements and what inspired you to do so 
well, you know, the first ones I wrote, I was still in Paris. So I was probably late 1990s. You know, I came to Boston in 2001. So I remember writing one for uh, like the final studio concert of, of Deep Mariner's class when I was in Paris. Uh, I wrote a duo, Moishele, which is one of the jazz duo that's on, on, on Opus Cello. I wrote that to play with my friend, uh, Raphael Merlin, who's in the Quatuor Eben. Um, so it was just sort of a spur of the moment thing. And then it really came into fruition. Um, oh, I, sh I should also add that when I was in Paris, I took some uh, harmony classes. So, you know, how to layer the chords and chord progression and all that stuff. So that was very, very helpful once I started writing for four cellos, knowing how to space out the voices, which is really what for, for my taste was a bit um, off-putting in like, you know, the old like, Langell or Romberg arrangements where the cellos are all scrunched up in the middle register and sounds really fat and really, you know, muddy. And I, I didn't really like that. My, my goal was really to make the cello quartets, you know, sing like a string quartet, which means, of course, stretching the, the range upwards mostly. So really it's when the Boston cello, quartet started, Boston cello quartet started that it made sense to have our own repertoire. You know, how do you separate yourself from other groups? Um, and so I just took it to heart to write, you know, stuff for us as much as I could. And I had some time on my hands. Um, and yeah, it worked out very well. We recorded some albums, uh, pictures and the Latin projects. And then after, after what happened with Opus Cello, that a, a lot of amateur cellists were asking me for the music. So like, oh, can you please give us the music? And for a while, I didn't want to give it, you know, it had to stay within the group. But then I was like, okay, some of it maybe I can let go. So I told them, you know, now I have a website and what's on the website you can get and what's not on there, please stop asking, you know. Um, and that's really how it started. And and now, you know, I have, I counted the other day, I have over 70 arrangements, not just from me, but from other people uh, in Europe, I think mostly, uh, who are great arrangers as well. And I'm just so thrilled that, you know, that now it's a place where people can can go and find anything they want from two to 12 cellos and, and all kinds of styles and all that. So that's, that's really nice to see the orders coming from all over the world. Yeah, no, I think it's so great how you're just helping expand the cello repertoire like this. I think it's, yeah, it's helping basically everyone. You're like, you're like Rostropovich. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I don't think, so. I didn't think so. But what I do think is, you know, sometimes when we, when we played those things, the Boston cello quartet, people are like, oh, it's too hard. And you know, and I look at what's happening in the cello world. The, the, at least the technical level is 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 getting higher and higher. And so I was not surprised, you know, that during the pandemic, a bunch of people, you know, I, I was sure when like Brandon Shaw decided to to do Claire de Lune with some of his friends and stuff. So yeah. there are lots of cellists. I mean, no, there's only one Brandon Shaw, but there are lots of you know very very good cellists who now can play that stuff. And I think it's going to stay that way. And and we like to be challenged, and we like to play with with our colleagues. Uh, and so it was actually one surprise from the pandemic. I thought maybe less people would order, but actually more people mm -hmm. went into the online thing to be able to play together online and make videos, and, and that was that was pretty cool. Yeah, no, it is it is incredible to see. Um, also, can you talk about sort of your process about just arranging, um, sort of these pieces? Like, is do you always have sort of the structure in your head which you'd like to follow, or is it new and organic every time? It really, but first it depends if do I have the, the, the original score or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, if, if you do like a Mozart overture, it, it's pretty straightforward because it's almost the same registers. Um, and that's also when you re when you realize when you arrange Mozart, how much he's like doing basically cut and paste, you know, in various keys and stuff. But when you read on the computer, which is what I do with, with Sibelius, you know, you're always cutting and pasting all over the place when you arrange Mozart. But the other problem is, for example, when I did the, the Piazzolla La Muerte de l'Angel, there was no music. So I did it, you know, by ear. I, I just listened to the recordings, the live recordings, Piazzolla, and just transcribe everything. And so sometimes I do that when I want to do like more jazzy stuff. Like, um, for example, on the Latin project, we have uh, Spain, the Chick Corea version. Um, and so there is, is you know, you're, it's jazz you're supposed to have solos, but I wrote them out. So in that case, I made up the stuff. But usually I'm, I'm very faithful to the score um, if there is one. And I, I really try to stay as close as I can to the original piece so it doesn't really change the sound world too much. Mm. 
but sometimes it's very challenging. I mean, in, in our first album on, on pictures with BCQ, um, I think it's what the the eggs, uh, the chicks in their eggs, belly of the chicks in their eggs, and that in, in pictures of an exhibition. So hard, so high, you know, but that's the only way to get it to sound right, you know, and so we, I mean, we, Adam is Benson who was playing first, you know, did sweat a lot on that one, but I think it sounds pretty good and I'm glad we did it. You know? Definitely, definitely. Also, is there any like particular composer that's like your favorite to sort of write arrangements for? Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I, I, I do think actually every time I arrange Mozart, I'm, I'm like blown away, like every time, every time, because it, in a way on, on, on paper or on the computer now, it seems so simple and yet it's so damn beautiful. And you're like, how did he do that? You know, it's just to match the simplicity. Sometimes I feel like the same thing with Schubert also and Schubert scores. The chords are so simple and yet so powerful. And then that really amazes me, I think more than a complicated score. Um, but I, you know, for arranging or, or for playing, I always say I, I don't have a favorite composer. It's whatever I'm doing at the moment. That's what matters to me. That's what I'm into. And then, and, and actually that's another thing about, about the, the orchestral job that I like is, is, you know, yes, the repertoire is vast and also we're switching every week. Every week is a different, different thing. And that's, that's fun. You know, you don't get stuck in the Dvorak concerto the, the whole year. So mm -hmm. it's switching it around a bit. I see. Um, do you think that sort of being an orchestral cellist for so long sort of has an impact on how you sort of make these arrangements? Because you're able to see, because um, obviously in an orchestra, it's completely different from like a soloist where you're just sort of the orchestra is just following after you. But do, do you think that sort of had an impact on how you arrange? Uh, I didn't think about it, <laughs> but you asked me the question. So I'll consider... Um... I don't know. I mean, I, I would think, you know, it's a, in orchestra, you listen a lot the same way you would in chamber music, you know. Um, um, I, I think definitely you you understand the registers. So maybe let's say something that was like in E flat clarinet wouldn't make sense to put it lower to me. Mm -hmm. um, you get a sense of the, vol the volumes too. So whether it's dynamics, um, you know, very often when I arrange and I wrote dynamics, I was already thinking about the balance. So it may not be a dynamic from the composer, but I know that for four cellos, I know if like cello three, I write nothing more and he keeps playing forte, he's gonna drown the rest or, you know. So that's the kind of stuff maybe I learned from orchestra where you're always paying attention to who really matters at which moment and, and you yeah. adjust. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I should think about it more. <laughs> Oh, and for my final question regarding sort of arranging, um, are there anything that you're working on right now or that you sort of hope to work on in the future that you're interested in? So uh, I have a much less time now. I mean, basically, since I'm in principal in Boston, I have a lot less time to arrange. Uh, so now my focus is really on, on publishing other people. So uh, like six, seven years ago, I had Aurélien Sabouré join in who's a good friend from France, who's principal at the Opera in Paris. Then I had Sébastien Warnier come in, who's principal at La Monnaie Opera in, in Brussels. And this year I had James Barlett uh, join in, who's from the UK. And so right now I'm busy publishing his stuff, uh, which I just got. Um, and that also takes time, you know, to, to format the stuff for the, the internet and the downloads and all that. Um, so I think that's my goal to, you know, going ahead is to keep publishing people and really I, I really handpick the people I publish that really match that style of, of very, very good music and very well arranged and and maybe in a way, you know, challenging. Like I don't I don't just try to put something online for the sake of putting something online. It, it I, I really hope it's a musical contribution, you know, it's a mm. challenge of repertoire. But my arranging days or, you know, I, I did something for Yo-Yo last summer, but that's like an exception, you know, because you don't say no when he asks for something. So. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So now to sort of move on to some um, questions regarding your the publishing of your book, Audition Day. I think that's so unique about you, about how like you're you're able to sort of also be the principal cellist of the BSO, fantastic cellist, but also be able to just fully publish like a, a great book for sort of all cellists of all levels. And you sort of mentioned before on the internet how you got inspired to write your book, Audition Day, after you got 
um, your position of being the principal chelps of the BSO. And can you, just, um, I just want to ask you if there are any other inspirations that sort of led you to writing this book? Well, there were many. I mean, first of all, when you say it's cool, I'm doing so many things. This book would not be out without the pandemic. Like, mm. you know, let's face it, if I was working normally, this book would not have existed. Um, so I really wrote it all during the pandemic. Um, um, I'm forgetting the gist of your question now. Sorry. Can, can, all right. Can you... um, are there any other inspirations that led you to sort of writing this book right. besides that one encounter with that individual who asked, who just jokingly asked you to write a book on auditioning? Yeah, you know, I, I, I thought there was a need. Well, the, the big thing for me, and, and I think how I arrived to, to getting my job as principal in Boston, is I had never, when I was in school, I had never thought about, you know, how to perform under pressure, how to, to think mentally before you go on stage. Um, I mean, I was always very, very shy, not too sure of myself, and then why are all those people looking at me? And, you know, and so, so... I think it's only when I when I when I later actually after I was in the BSO uh, when I started playing golf that's when I started reading about sports psychology and all that and you know and that was really helpful for my game of golf and then I, I realized you know that golf will help me for cello and um, and so I got a bit more into it I read a bunch of books um, I followed the blog you know by uh, by Noah uh, bulletproof musician which I highly recommend. And, and so I think that's a, a side of our job that's really underexplored by, by you know, music students in school is, is really how to feel good on stage. You know, some of us or some of them are okay with it and are fine with it. And others could learn a thing or two. But I think we're a bit behind on that. You know, sports, you know, people are so much ahead. You know, they all have a psychologist working with them, you know, all the time or a performance coach or... And so... That's one thing I wanted to share is, is, is really how to get your mind in, in the right mindset for, for the actual event of the audition, how to organize your practice, um, because it was challenging for me to prepare the audition. You know, we had the program three months before. Um, the second time I took it, we were recording a Shostakovich Symphony the week before. It was very, very busy. So how can you get, you know, with a body in good shape and the mind fresh, you know, after only three months of work and having an orchestra job at the same time to a, such a big audition. And so I think looking back, I was very, very, very organized. Um, and I think a lot of my colleagues who won big jobs also were that way. And and I just felt, you know, it was good to, to, to share it uh, with music students because I realized when I was talking about it that a, a lot of them had just no clue, you know, how, how those things happen. And and so I wanted to share that. And also I felt uh, as far as the music itself, like the excerpts, um, I think a lot of us had like the, the Leonard Rose books and and I'm a huge fan of Leonard Rose, but I, I thought the books were a bit outdated. A lot of stuff we don't play anymore and also no explanations. And so if you put a fingering and you don't explain why, you know, I, I'm not sure it's going to help a lot. And, and because orchestral auditions are so... So not really targeted on each excerpt on what we're looking for. I really wanted people to be aware of what, why those excerpts are on the list. You know, if you're playing Brahms two, what are we looking for? If you're playing Mendelssohn, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Scherzo, what are we looking for? And so I thought that was very important that the information is out there, that you don't have to, you know, go pay a few hundred bucks for a private lessons with 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 an orchestra member so you can gain the secrets. And I'm not against against private lessons. It's great. You know, it's important too. But I think, you know, the book is 40 bucks. It's everywhere. Like a lot of the stuff is already there. And, and then maybe once you get a lesson with somebody, you already have a, a good start, you know, on the game. Um, and, and you know, it's, the book has been selling well. And, and even people who already have jobs are, are getting it and are getting into it. And so I'm really glad. Also, I'm really glad it's helping people who don't necessarily play cello. I've had, you know, everything from horn players to violinists to double bass players coming to me and then and saying how they enjoyed the book or used it for an audition so i'm really i'm really glad i'm really glad i could do that at that time because as i said now i'm, I'm a bit too busy when i work at, at bso and uh yeah i'm glad it's out there definitely and so you just sort of describe this as like a, a pandemic passion project um mm -hmm. sort of can you describe the the process of 
when you wrote this book? Like, was it sort of an on and off thing? Or did you just sit down and just grind it up like in the middle of the pandemic? Um, well, the pandemic felt pretty long. I mean, the, the excerpts, I had, I had done a few excerpts at the very, very start of the pandemic, just, just uh, doing the, the bowings, and also I do all the editing myself, you know, for the music that takes a lot of time to write the fingering and the bowing. And, um, so that took a while to do all the excerpts, to pick which excerpts, to do all of them, to make sure I wasn't writing anything stupid. Uh, and of course, there are still some mistakes that happen, but then now, now everything is corrected. Um, uh, I think for the writing part, it went pretty fast. Um, I always liked writing and I think once I get going, like the ideas, I mean, the phrases come out pretty fast. Um, and then I had some help, you know, I had some help, uh, to format actually my, my English to make sure it's not French English, but, you know, American English. So I had some help for that. I had some help, you know, to design the book. I had a great, you know, cartoonist, uh, who made really cool drawings for the book, um, so it, it was a teamwork and not only was a teamwork, but, you know, the project was quite funded on, on Kickstarter. And, and to me, it always still warms my heart to think that, you know, actually within a week, you know, I had done the crowdfunding for the book. Um, and so that also proved to me that there was, there was really a thirst for that kind of information from the, the cello community. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for all those early backers, you know, that who made it happen because it's, it's really not a small, it, it, I'm, I'm glad I can do all those things through Opus Cello, but it's really, it's really a big task to, to publish a book. And mm -hmm. so to have all that help and all that, also all that belief in the project was, was very important. Definitely. Yeah. Like despite how terrible the pandemic was, I think the publishing of your book and such was, it was truly a blessing in those times. Um. So for my final question regarding writing the book, is there any, are you planning on writing any books in the future? Like, I, I, th I think I, I ordered my copy, but uh, I haven't read it yet. But uh, I think from what I've heard, obviously, it's it's very well written. I think it's very well organized. Um, so are you planning on doing it again in the future? Because it's obviously you're good at it. Well, I mean, it would have to be different. So I, it did cross my mind to maybe one day make something more about, the, you know, orchestral solos, maybe. Mm. Uh, but then I still want to get more experience under my belt. You know, I've been doing it, you know, five years now. Um, so it could happen someday. Um, although I, I think the text would, wouldn't be as long as this one because I don't need to repeat myself. So it would be more about how to play a solo, how to get into the mindset of playing a solo. But I, I, don't, I don't think it would be as big a, a project. I think it would be probably more music than, than text in that case, you know. Mm. And I don't even know if I'll, I will do it or not. We'll see. <laughs> Perhaps when you retire. But yeah, we're not there yet. But yeah. <laughs> um, so now sort of to move on to questions about um, the differences between being a sort of a soloist and orchestral cellist. So I saw clips on of you playing on YouTube, the, like the St. Sans cello concerto and the Shostakovich cello concertos. And uh, obviously these are like, especially the Shostakovich, like, perhaps the most drastically different that you can get from perhaps like, like orchestral cello playing. Like obviously the Shostakovich cello concerto requires like immense projection from the soloist, right? And and obviously the same sound as well, you really need incredible projection as well. So how do you prepare yourself for like these concerts where you play such drastically different repertoire than what you normally play in orchestral setting? And, and, and this is in terms of like technique perhaps for the bow and also mentally? Um, yeah, well, you know, I mean, sonically, it's actually, uh, you know, it's actually not really what you would think because I, I find like my job to play solos within an orchestra, that's where I need projection a lot. That's where I need to really cut through, you know, a mass of sound and somehow get through it and be heard. And that's actually harder than people think, you know, I, I really believe maybe people are not really aware of that. And actually, it was very funny. The, the first rehearsal I had of this uh, of the Saint Sans with with the BSO, we played I think the the first movement only, and I, I turned to Andres and I said like, I can't really hear the orchestra very well. <laughs> you know, he was like, okay, guys, you need to play louder now. But you know, it was it was it was true because now I was on the podium. You know, I was propped up, and my son was going out in the center of the hall, 
and the orchestra was below, you know, and so it's very different from being in the orchestra, within the orchestra and trying to play through. And so I, I think actually as soloists have a really big advantage sonically, you know, we have this image of the orchestra, you know, always too loud, all that, but really they have it easier than, than us trying to play a solo, let's say in like a, a Strauss tone poem and try to hammer out a solo when, you know, the whole horn section is playing or something, you know. So, you know, in that sense, I think it's actually easier acoustically for a soloist. Uh, of course, the mindset is so totally different. Um, you know, you you really have to give, I mean, it's, it's a lot more about you, obviously. Um, so you have to be comfortable with that, with all that 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 focus. Um, still now, I get very, very nervous when I play a concerto. It's, it's quite horrible. So I think I made the right choice as far as my job. Um, but I, at the same time, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, we're all musicians and, and you're still making music. You know, it's not like when in orchestra, I'm, I'm, I'm passive or less invested or quite the opposite. I'm still very invested in orchestra. Um, but I, I think it, it doesn't really come as a, as I think as a shock musically. I think it's more the setting of being alone uh, and I'm wondering like, oh, am I, you know, interesting enough to be on that position? And, you know, am I going to sound, you know, better than Shupovich or way worse or pretty worse? But uh, so it's, you know, that's very different. And and I frankly, I don't quite have the soloist mindset. I think also sometimes I think people have that expectation of me of being a principal cello that I'm probably dying to be a soloist or something. And I, I'm not like, I'm really happy being a principal cellist and especially of the BSO. That's the perfect landing spot for me. Um, but I think it's, it's important for me to keep playing solo, to to keep expressing myself, to keep growing with that process, which is different from orchestra. And every time I do so, I, I learn. And, you know, even when I did the Shostakovich, I always thought, you know, Shostakovich is not for me, you know. And then I was like, okay, I'll, I'll I, mean, I mean, I was asked to play it. And then I was like, okay, I'll try it. And I've been recording also all those Shostakovich symphonies. So I have that background and... Once I done, I did it. I, I was very happy. I did, and I I felt like that clear. I was okay playing it. You know, it was not a crime for me to play that. Um, um, so I think it's it's always good. I mean, as I talk about that in the book, it's always good to challenge yourself. And even even now in my life, I always have to find some challenges so I don't get too comfortable and I can keep keep growing. Um, but yeah, solo or orchestra. You know, it's I, I think it's a mindset. I think it's a it's a personality type, you know. I think. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to know a lot of, of the, the guys who are big soloists around the world, and it's definitely a personality type that you, you want to be out there, you want to travel, you want to play. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort to do that kind of job. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. And also, I wanted to ask you: Is there any specific concerto that you particularly think that suits you or that you enjoy playing? Um. Well, I mean, I love Dvorak. Like I think many, many cellists I love Dvorak. I think Schumann always fit me well. So it's, it's a good thing. It was always asked for, for BSO auditions. I like the Haydn's too. Uh, Sansons, I think, fits me well too. Um, I guess I'm 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 a bit lazy probably. So that's why when it gets harder, like Shostakovich or, or Prokofiev or, or, you know, I'm like, do I really want to do this? You know? <laughs> But I, but I I love it. I remember you know studying Lutoslavsky when I was in school, and I love this piece, and I really hope I get to play it someday. Um, and the Prokofiev Factory, I think, is is such a magnificent piece. It's just so beautiful. Mm. Um, it's really not you know just a technical challenge. So I I I think once again I always have this philosophy you know that I, I heard from Philippe Muller when I was in Paris that your favorite piece should be whatever you're doing at that moment, and so. You know, it could be like Shostakovich, for example. I think like, oh, maybe it's not my thing and then I'm really enjoying it. So I'm always open to new opportunities. And next season I'm doing a, a new concerto by Elena Langer for choir, orchestra and solo cello. And it was premiered by the LSO, I think in March, last March. And so I look forward to doing that. Uh, but I assume for that, I will feel a bit more free because Usually when it's new music, I, I feel less tied by traditions and expectations. And I feel like I'm just, you know, I can be a bit more myself. So I really look look forward to to playing that piece. Definitely, definitely. Um, now to sort of move on to our final stage of questions regarding sort of general slash life, slash maybe philosophical questions. So 
first begin, I was wondering just what what is your daily routine like, like on tour and off tour? Uh, I don't know if I really have a routine. So I uh, I can't say I, I'm really not obsessed with practicing. So it's it, I practice what I have to to learn. You know, I, usually my practice is learning notes uh, for that week or that concert. Um, of course, practicing for an audition is something totally different, and that's in, in the book. Um, but usually, when I when I play at BSO, you know, I rehearse Tuesdays through Thursdays, and first concert Thursdays, and Friday Saturday, and sometimes Sunday. And then I teach on Mondays at at NEC, so I'm I'm fairly busy, and so a, a big part now of my life with everything I have going on is more how to manage my body, so how to make sure I don't get injured, you know, because I know a lot of people who love practicing, and sometimes some of them get injured, and then that's really trouble, right? And so I'm really trying to do my best, you know, to to not do too much because uh, BSO is already a demanding job. So over time, I've learned how to say no, because of when I was younger, I was always so excited to say yes to this concert and that chamber music and that concerto. And yeah, yeah, awesome. And and then you're, you know, and then you're really tired. So I, I'm very careful now. My priority is really to be in shape for the BSO and and, and the few things I accept next to it. Uh, but I don't really have a routine. I mean, I, I maybe have a warm up routine, you know, when I when I get to work of like just long open strings and some foyer type exercises for the left hand just to wake up some shifts. Um, I really like the, the Bukinik shift, shifting book. I don't know if you know that one. It's on IMSLP. Um, so it's just really small things. And then, you know, like now, for example, I'm going to the International Cello Institute in Minnesota in July. And so I have a recital there with Mendelssohn too and WC and Strauss Romance. So I'm practicing that right now. And I just, you know, I practice, you know, 45 minutes here, 45 minutes there, uh, but not not too much. Yeah. yeah. I also noticed on your Instagram, and you sort of interestingly bring up sort of the aspect of making sure you're physically in shape, how you're also, I believe, an avid tennis fan. Well, I, I, I love sports. I don't, I don't play tennis. I played when I was a kid. Uh, but yes, I did go to Roland Garros a few times to the French Open. I like watching. I love golf. Mm -hmm. So I, I play golf as much as I can. Um, I Yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and very often I'm inspired. Like, for example, I, you know, I also love watching the, the NBA and, and I'm a Celtics fan. And and so watching the finals this year and, and, and I really sort of fell in love with Nikola Jokic. You know, I didn't really know this guy very well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I very much identified with him, not because I'm an NBA All-Star or MVP, but because, you know, when he said like, you know, we, yeah, we did the job after he won the whole thing and we did the job. Now we can go home, I can go home with my family. And, and that's really my, my, my view of life. Like I, sometimes I get, I get a bit frustrated at this expectation or, or even this, this uh, idealization of, of being fully devoted in your life to music and what a beautiful thing to be lost in music. And I'm like, no, no, I want my life, you know, my real life on the side. That's not on stage. That's not with music. And I love spending time with my friends, being with my cat, being at home, enjoying walks and, and all that. And I, 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 so I really like, you know, all, all those things Jokic was saying, it just, you know, I think he said also something about uh, basketball, it's not my life, it's, it's not my life, it's, it's something I'm good at. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, how many people should hear that, you know, because how many musicians get lost into like, oh, you know, music, 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 and, and are, are unhappy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's very important to have that balance, you know, between the, the life at home and, and, and the stage. Definitely. So sort of on the topic of, of sports and other sort of maybe artistic mediums, like besides just chill and music, are there any other sort of art that inspire you in life? Anything. I mean, first of all, for music, I listen to anything, you know, from, from EDM to reggae to, to rap to really anything. Jazz, I love jazz and blues. Um, I I love I love I love art in general, like like visual arts. So I, uh, yeah, I love I I I love modern abstract art in particular, like post-war stuff, uh, like Soulage, Hartung, Delaunay, uh, like Liechtenstein in the U.S., like pop art. Um, and so yeah, I find that inspiring and and. 
a few weeks ago or a month ago, I was in France and I have a big uh, collection of Pierre Soulage in Montpellier where my parents live. And uh, it was just so great to see that collection uh, in person, you know, I mean, and there's something with uh, about his painting, you know, they so sort of visceral, like you see the, you see the, um, uh, how, how do you explain it? You kind of see the, the paste of the, the paint on the, on the, on the canvas, you know, it's so sort of heavy and, and, and raw and, and it's, it's just really inspiring to see. And so I got some books also with him talking about art and I'm reading that right now. And it's, it's fascinating. I think, you know, you know, whenever I play music, I'm usually like totally immersed into the emotions of, of what I'm playing. And, and very often when I, when I, when I finish a concert, you know, and people start clapping, I'm still a bit in a daze of the whole thing. You know, I don't, I don't really want to stand up and, and bow and be clapped at and go home. I just, I'm still like, it would almost be better for me if nobody clapped and we stayed in the, what the music, what music happened, you know? And so I get very touched by the music and the same for me with visual arts is, is if I like something visually, it really is something that really touch, touches me really, really deep within. Um, and, and so it's interesting also with, with my taste in art, I realized sometimes it evolves. So there was a, a time I really liked dark stuff and then I evolved to more colorful stuff. And, 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 and a lot of the times the artists I like were connected, were friends. And, and so it, it's, it's really fascinating, but I think you can, you know, you can learn from from anything and everything. Um, in the end, whether it's visual art or music, it's, it's communication, and so are you able to communicate or not? And and that's why, in a way, also when you know, the more I think about music, you know, I mentioned Yo Yo earlier, but we're lucky he lives in in, in Boston in Cambridge, and he he plays at Tangwood every summer and with the BSO all the time, and. And he's the best example of, of a communicator, you know, and that's that's really all I care about now in a concert is is are people touched or not? You know, if somebody comes to me and say like, "Oh, it was so technically perfect," like I, I couldn't care less. That's a that's a big fail for me. But if somebody comes to me and say like, "Oh, my Jesus, there was so, so many emotions, it was so touching," that's that's my job. Even better if they cried, then it's really good, you know. <laughs> so. So I, I think, yeah, it's the same with the visual arts and I, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and I was also wondering who are sort of your like music, your musical and sort of cellist heroes that you have and what aspect of them do you admire the most? Well, I had a lot and, and frankly, you know, it can, it could range from, from people I went to school with, to people I work with right now, to people, of course, I have recordings of and, um, so when I was a kid, a lot of my early teachers had studied with Janosch Tucker. And mm -hmm. so Janosch Tucker was actually, even before I met them, was one of my idols at his back suites recording. And you know, I, I always remember that 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 dark cover was he was pretty young back then, was in the dark and he's playing. And and back then my goal was was to to look like him. So I'm getting there slowly. Uh, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Um, and then I think later on, I had two big, you know, sort of musical crushes. And the first one was Leon Fleischer, the pianist, mm. whom I met when in my first first year, I think, at the conservatory in Paris. And that was just the way he was phrasing and the purity of the phrasing. And it, it was just, it all made so much sense to me. And I also, it was a time he was still recovering from his dystonia, but he was starting to feel better. And so once he has to like read some Brahms piano quartets with the students. And I was lucky because the other cellist, uh, was actually Eric Marek Couturier, the other cellist from Ensemble Pacot Corin, the other cellist was away for a concert. So I was the only, only one available who had never played those pieces. And so if you know the beautiful, you know, slow movement of the C minor, you know, which is all cello and piano, the first time I played it was with Leon Fleischer, which is pretty good. So I, I remember just like running to the, the little, you know, audio library they had over there uh, in the South of France, at the Guild Pro Academy, and listening to actually to Yo-Yo's recording with with Maniacs, and and then the next day we played it was just it was just so amazing, and and that was really the first shock, and also the idea that you can learn from someone who's not a cello player, you know, like he really changed the way I phrase, and he's a, he's a pianist, and uh, and it was actually interesting because as a pianist. He was always trying to go beyond the piano. He was trying to make people forget it's a percussive instrument. So he was trying to do long lines. 
to do legal or to, and and that was really interesting to me and that's something I always think about when I when I play when I practice when I teach is of course the cello is a beautiful instrument but I also don't want them to hear the string crossings to hear the shifts you know all those technical things they should really be out of the picture so I think that's a similar mindset here and then my my next big uh, musical crush was Bernard Greenhouse mm. also made in France a few years later uh, along with Louis Claret. And so he's actually the one who told me to come to Boston and, and study with, with uh, Lawrence Lesser at NEC and see him on, on the Cape and Cape Cod at the same time. So that's why I came to the US. And, and Greenhouse, um, you know, I had lessons with him that were sort of like an out of body experience, but he would tell me how to do things, like how to do a shift. And I would do it and it would be just so good and beautiful. And, but just like, I, I don't know, I'm the one who did it. I just did what he told me to do, you know. And so that was very re revelatory to me how he could like have a technique to make something beautiful. Mm. And, 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 you know, for, for me, that's much more reliable because I, I talked earlier about having emotion when I play and that's important. But if you only rely on hopefully feeling good at your concerts, if you play, you know, like me, two or 300 concerts per year, there's going to be some concerts where you don't really want to be there or you don't feel mm. good. Or, and if the audience hears that, you're not doing your job well, you know. And so what I already learned with Mr. Greenhouse was how, how to be consistent in my, in my expression, in my means of expressions. And, um, and that I'm, I'm forever grateful for. And I always wish, you know, he could still be there, you know, that I, now that I have a, a good job. I'm sure he would be happy. But then, you know, like I said, I learned from everybody around me when I joined the BSO. Uh, you know, I learned so much from all my colleagues. I learned so much from the cello quartet. I learned so much from, you know, the trombones, the clarinets, the violins. Um, and I think, you know, I, I wrote a, a blog post about that on my website, but it's always a bit of a strange balance for us of, of between humility and confidence, because let's say if you're a very confident kid in, in school, maybe you think you're already pretty damn good and you don't need to do anything and then you're going to stagnate. Right. Whereas if you're very humble, well, you may keep pushing yourself, but then if you're too humble, you won't have the confidence to be on stage. Mm. So it's 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 always a strange thing for me. Like I feel like when I look back and I feel like, yes, sir, I, I I did pretty well in my in my orchestral career. I think I got there because I was I was humble and I had to learn the other way how to be more confident. Um so I think it's an interesting thing to consider to any for anybody at, at any point in their life, like where do I stand now? Should I push myself more? Should I just be more okay with what I'm doing and, and be more confident with what I'm doing? Um, I think one thing I always also remembered from Philippe Muller was he said, like, to be to be convincing, you have to be convinced. And so that's a very good thing to remember that if you go on stage to play something, you better believe that's what you want to do. And so even when I was preparing the BSO principal audition, you know, I played for some colleagues and sometimes I got different kinds of advice, you know, and so I had to decide, you know, I'm going to do this way or that way. And always I went back to doing my way, the way I was feeling the best ways, you know. Um, but yeah, it's always, you're always adjusting to see how, how good you can be. Yeah. Definitely. And so for my next question, I just want to ask you, um, what do you think are the benefits of classical music in our society today? If there's any specific benefits. Oh, there are some. Let me turn out my dehumidifier because it just kicked in. Okay, okay, definitely. <laughs> Sorry about that. All good. You know, I think it gets very humid, so I got to keep my cello at the right. Yeah, yeah. At home. yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I think a lot of people who come to, to a classical music concert for the first time are, are usually blown away, I think. Um, because they don't expect, you know, that amount of sound, that amount of colors. Um, um, I think it's a very emotional experience for, for most people. Um, I think it's important because, um, you know, I, I think about it sometimes, you know, even, even with, with art, I mean, everybody can have their taste in art and all that, or, or what quality means, um, and I think usually in, 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 in music, there is a sense, of, I mean, most of what I like has a sense of beauty to it, you know. And, and, and yes, a lot of the time that beauty takes a lot of hard work to, to get to, just like a jeweler or, or a painter or, a, you know, a cabinetry maker, you know, would work 
with the same same concept. And so I think that that idea, first of all, that you're creating something beautiful, that you're doing it for other people, that you're doing it with other people. Um, you know, I think that is a very strong concept. I mean, if if you know, if you look at the the, the makeup uh, in the BSO of the orchestra, we have people coming from really everywhere, all kind of ages. Um, and you know, most people get along, maybe some don't, but then we all come together for the concert, and it's beautiful. You know, I think there's something about about listening to somebody else, exchanging with somebody else, um, with a common goal that you know the blueprint for how so many things should be working. You know, um, so yeah, I think classical music is very important. That's why I also believe, you know, when 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 people say like, oh, you know, my my kid, yeah, he's doing the cello, but I don't think he's gonna do long term as is as it's a sad thing. It's it's not necessarily a sad thing. We also need people who learn what music is like, carry it out in their life, and maybe one day become an audience member or trustee or you know have you know new new ideas for how to bring classical music forward. And that's important too. And they're gonna learn skills like maybe leadership and 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 listening is by the way, you know, part of leadership as well. Um, that's going to serve them in their career, even if they're a doctor or a politician or, um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it's very useful. And also, you know, just like anything that you learn, it can make you very proud of yourself that you can do something like this. It's a community thing. You're going to make friends. I mean, I made so many friends with all my youth orchestras. I saw, I traveled so much through Europe as a, as a teenager there was no way I was going to travel that much if I was not playing the cello. Mm. And it's still true today. Like everything I've seen, it's thanks to, to the cello playing and then the orchestra tours. And, and I'm really, I'm really so grateful for that. And, you know, almost, I mean, almost all the time when I'm on stage, I'm singing like, this is heaven. Like, I don't know if there's something else after, but, you know, right now, if you get to play Bruckner 7 or, I don't know, Mahler 9 or, or, you know, with a great orchestra in the great hall, like the symphony hall, this is pretty damn good. You know, I, I could do that for a long time. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and sort of my, for my second to last question, um, I was just wondering, what would you just personally like to achieve in your career? Uh, nothing, uh, really nothing. I, <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm already, I feel like I'm already beyond what I thought I would ever do in my life. You know, I, I, you know, I'm glad I have the job that I have, but it's not like my life dependent on it. So I'm very content with where I am. I, like I said, I'm not running after more concertos and more exposure and all that. Um, I like to enjoy my, my personal life. Um, I, you know, I, I do hope to maybe make a couple recordings. So there's a trace somewhere of, of what I sound like. I, I do like teaching. So I like passing on the information. Um, because I think actually that lasts a bit longer than than just playing yourself. Um, and also, I another reason I like teaching is is you know I I worked very hard I think my 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 whole life because um, my my brother is very very talented and so I was always trying to catch up to him and so I was I was working hard and I I think because I worked hard because I was not too talented you know I had to understand what I was doing. And so that means also when I teach now, I can explain why I'm doing this, why I'm doing that, and and for what goal. And and in a way, that's more helpful for teaching than just being innately talented and not knowing how, you know. Um, so I hope to, you know, keep teaching. I hope also to just have a, a positive impact generally. You know, it's just like when you look at someone like Yo-Yo, uh, you know, you see the positive in, impact in, in whatever he's doing. And so that's part of what I feel like we're doing with the quartet. That's what I'm trying to do with Opus Cello. You know, get cellists to play more together and, and have more fun and be friends and and all that. And so that's also something that you know will stay on, you know, even when I'm when I'm dead. Those arrangements will stay and I'll make sure they, they keep going. Um so yeah, I just hope I can give a little bit of help. You know, what I saw a lot with the cello quartet were all those kids, young kids coming and being in awe of what we were doing and being so excited about the cello. And, and, and you know, it's funny that when you mentioned like that you knew my name from the, the show choir on YouTube, there was a, a student at NEC and I remember I saw him at a at a concert and I, I was already principal of the BSO and he, he came up to me with his mom and 
and he didn't really look at me. And then his mom was like, oh, you know, this is this is Jardin. And, and she said, principal Chilo Biasol. I was like, oh, OK. And he plays in the Boston Chile Choir. I was like, oh, oh, you're in the Boston Chile Choir. Yeah, Piazza Lavi Deo. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so that's what got him excited, you know. And so that's that's just so funny that, that that's something really that brought people joy and excitement. And, you know, I it, it's really nice now to see all those other cello groups that are popping up. and. Like I'm a big fan of like Galvin Cello Quartet and 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 there's Ocelli in 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 Belgium that's pretty amazing as a noctet. Um and so that really makes me happy. If people keep playing cello ensembles, people are in, inspired by music, um, if people want to play together, you know, because I mean in, in a way, like I always think, you know, every year at every year at the BSO we have our retirement ceremonies, you know. So we have maybe one couple of players for retiring the ceremony, a little bit of food and drinks and speeches and all that. And, you know, I always get very emotional because so it's a big part of your life that's stopping then. But I always notice, you know, no matter, nobody actually cares at that time how the person played. You know, maybe people who write online will care about it, but nobody in that room cares about it. All they care about is, is what kind of person was that person, you know? And so, you know, that's why it's very important for me, like in orchestra, that we just get along, that the section gets along together, that we support each other. And I think it's the case. And I, I, I really, really enjoy that. So I hope I hope that will be something that stays from, from when I leave, you know. <laughs> and for my final question, I think for me, it's just a fun question for myself and some people watching, because I asked the same question to, the previous people I interviewed, like Vladimir Fong and Andre Yunita. Uh, if you just had to play, if you were just on your deathbed and you just had to play one last, maybe concerto piece, um, or just like play with an orchestra, just one last piece, what would it be for you? Oof. That's a tough question. Um... It can be multiple if you need, maybe top three. Oh, it's, it's, it's really hard to, it's very really hard to pick. My, I mean, my easy answer would be that I would probably be happy whatever piece it, I mean, happy and sad, whatever piece it is. Um, I know, like I always thought, I mean, let me be grim to say, but like when I, if I were sort of like organizing my funeral or something, I would really like the Cantique de Jean Racine, the Forêt, from Forêt, which I arranged for six cellos. And that that also to me is a bit of a description of heaven. And I always felt like, you know, if I pass away and Chelis want to play at my funeral, maybe that's something I'd like them to play. But for me to play a last piece, ah, oh, it's 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 hard to pick. It will happen someday, at least with BSO, hopefully. Um you know, like I said, I, I I always feel emotions when I play a piece of music. It's I mean, of course, there are moments in, in Mahler symphonies that are just so grand, and but also Brahms. Um, you know, I remember playing um, one of those back keyboard concertos with Andreas Schiff a few years ago. I think at least there's a clip on YouTube, a slow movement, just we're just playing pizzicato, and that was just pure heaven. It was just so beautiful, so simple, and I was doing basically nothing. Um, so, you know, whatever the last piece is, I think I'll be happy. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll I'll always be happy playing music, and actually that's a very comforting thing, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's a perfect answer. I think that's a perfect answer. Anyways, thank you so much for your time, Blaze. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Was fun talking to you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, best wishes to you. Bye.